Great. Welcome you all to Jenkins GSOC meeting today. We have Kristen Wetstone with us today, which is great because she's going to do um, a walkthrough of the Jenkins Step Docs generator. I hope I've said that correctly, but I'll let, I'll let Mark say a bit more than Kristen present as well. Yeah, so, so there, is a, there is a tool called the Pipeline Steps Doc Generator that Kristen, I believe, was actually the original <laughs> author of. And mm -hmm. what this yep. tool does is it extract, it, it is the generator that presents uh, pages to www.jenkins.io that describe all the pipeline steps from right now hundreds of Jenkins plugins. So, so it somehow does work some very cool magic and reads source code from all sorts of different plugins and presents them as web pages. Now, Kristen, you'll give a much better description than I do of that, but, but for me, it's just an impressive piece of work. Tell us more about it. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so basically, it does exactly what you were saying. Um, and I like to think of this generator in two distinct parts. Um, the first part is kind of this entire local, hyper, like call it the hyperlocal plugin manager, which basically acts as a plugin manager that exists outside of Jenkins that allows you to be able to do, like it loads plugins just as you would inside of Jenkins, but it doesn't require Jenkins to run. And the second half of this is the actual part that goes through and like generates the ASCII doc that's required by the website to um, actually be displayed so you can see it. <laughs> beautifully and like with many different layers and stuff and drill down and the links inside of um, the documentation. So I guess I will kind of, I can kind of go over it in two, in those two parts. Um, would it be helpful if I shared my screen? I, I assume so. I think yes. it will help people if I, so, so you use the term hyper local plugin manager. There are a lot of words hiding in there. So I'm looking yeah. forward to more description of what, what, what that means compared to how Jenkins plugins normally operate. Sure. All right. So I, I'll cut. There's this is kind of the entire um, project here, and it's only a few classes <laughs> to make this entire thing go. Um, so I'll close this folder here. So the entrance into the pipeline steps extractor, or the, into like this entire thing here, is this class called pipeline steps extractor, and it imports a lot, and it looks scary, but it's because it has to be able to pretty. We're pretty much like faking out a lot of what Jenkins does when it does all of the plugin loading when it starts up. So let's we'll get down here. Um, there's a bunch of parameters. So you can say basically um, what, so, so part of this is because we're, if you're basically faking out the beginning, we're faking out the beginning part of Jenkins, we have to tell it to point to a plugins directory. Um, so, and the plugins directory should be pre-populated with all the plugins that you would like to import. So as part of the build step for this job, we actually go and we go to like the Jenkins plugin site and we download all of the plugins ever <laughs> into a folder. And, we're, and these are the HPI or the JPI files. Pretty much exactly like if you took up Jen, if you took your Jenkins instance and wanted to install every single plugin that we make. And the reason we do this is because in this generator, we have no idea what the pipeline steps are. And every day, since new plugins are added or plugins are enhanced, they might now have a pipeline step. And we want to make sure that we capture that in the documentation. So it's safer for us to be able to just go straight out to Jenkins, the plugin site, and just copy down everything. And this can be a lot. <laughs> this is a lot of things we're trying to load into our fake, like basically our like our plugin manager. Um, so there are a few things that we do to kind of like prevent too many open file handlers, because um, that's you have too many things loaded at once. But generally at this point, um, it works. So I haven't seen any issues with it dealing with the massive hundreds of plugins that we have inside of Jenkins so far. Um, so so are, do you want questions during, or do you want questions to be a little later? What's your preference? Um, you can do it during. Um, okay, so, so, okay, so, so, the, the, the early step is download all the plugin binary files, mm -hmm. all the plugin binaries to the local file system so that you can then process them. So you download, or the tool downloads 1,500 or 1,700 plugins from the Jenkins update site and now has them locally. Did yeah, I understand? So the, 
you'll have to download or point it to whatever plugins you want. The tool doesn't. I think the Jenkins, oh. the Jenkins job for the tool does. The tool just will use whatever directory it's pointing at. It, think of it like Jenkins, right? Like you, you want to be able to have your plugin prop plugins directory pre-populated. Same thing with the tool. So okay, so it it takes whatever is there. So yeah. I can define a subset for exactly. testing purposes. Exactly. So I'm not always processing all the plugins. Exactly. Okay, nice. Right. Because that takes forever. And then sometimes it's actually, yeah. So if you have a fewer subset that you know that exactly what it should be, it's good to be able to visually test what you want. <laughs> so you can make sure when it produces the documentation, you can see like, okay, yes, this is correct. <laughs> also, so it's, it just runs a lot faster when it's not working on every single plugin ever. Um, well, Oh, go for it. That explains the, the comment in the README that there is in the README instructions which guide us use this workflow command, there are this build command to bring in the plugins that are workflow plugins. Right. Thank you. So, so, so I started actually updating the README because after I saw that comment in the channel that it was outdated, I was like, oh, okay. So I started trying to go through this and I was hoping to do a pull request at some oh, point, kind of explaining a lot of this in like the architecture section and then. Um, maybe helping with a little bit more of a readme. So I'll make a pull request with this updated information, but it's still good that we're doing this today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, so that's where that part comes in. And so now we, we go into this method. We have a bunch of different, um, like a place where you want to print, print the ASCII doc and that there's like declarative pipeline syntax that's generated by this too. And right, like this is just kind of like where the file at the end of all this gets written. And then if you're missing that, it will fill in some automatic stuff. <laughs> All right, so the next piece we wanna do is it comes here and says, find steps. And this is the part where we, we start by basically creating what, we call, what I've referred to here as the hyperlocal plugin manager. And this here is the plugin manager without Jenkins. So we'll go into that class now. All right, so um, during Jenkins startup, um, it does a lot of things <laughs> and one of them is it starts its plugin manager defines what's called a plugin strategy and then points it to the plugins folder and then loads it and then in the middle of all that loading jenkins is doing other things at the same time and then it comes back basically to the plugin manager the plugin manager reports like i'm done um, you can actually have access to all of these classes like the plugin manager will load all the classes into um, an extension list and in, like into itself into a class loader and then be able to have that available to Jenkins outside of everything else. So if you ever look inside Jenkins and like how it uses plugins, it basically can go to this class loader and pull information about um, what is installed and like what it can do. So what we're trying to do here is like, all right, we don't have, and the plugin manager like requires a running Jenkins because it's very hard at this point to have things that are separated. So what we're doing here is to say, all right, I just want to mock Jenkins and basically use, say like, yes, it's running, but I just want like the plugin manager instance. So there's a lot in here that is like very, very complicated because it's how Jenkins itself runs. And a lot of times like we don't necessarily care about what Jenkins is doing. We just want basically to fill up this class loader so we can get access to it and then with the class loader, we can now access the annotations. And we know from how to write pipeline steps that pretty much annotations are the way that you say that this is a pipeline step. Um, so after we have this class loader filled out, we could go and basically query it for the, like the pipeline step annotations and then pull out everything that we know is a pipeline step. So <laughs> that's maybe a little complicated, but what this will, this method here called diagram plugins is the one that actually goes into the plugins folder and imports everything into the plugin manager. So a lot of this is lifted directly from the plugin manager class um, inside of Jenkins itself. So the details of this is not too important, but the important thing is that it matches exactly how the plugin manager is doing it. The way that we can get away with having a Jenkins, it, basically not having Jenkins, is we're using Marquito to basically fake out Jenkins, just like if you're writing a unit test, <laughs> but we're using it here inside of the code. So there's, there's, whenever there are certain methods that it calls to say, like, is Jenkins there? 
we pretty much return an answer that's like, yes, Jenkins is here. Or, <laughs> or um, like the init level is something that it will um, check as well. So the Jenkins init level will tell you where it is in the startup process and it's required to be completed before the plugin manager complete. So we just say, yeah, yeah, it was complete. <laughs> Same thing here, like um, this install state is another piece that's needed by Jenkins. So we just return that it's in test. Um, this is, oh yes, and if you're ever trying to get the plugin manager, so whenever we instantiate that, like, when you say git mock Jenkins, I think this is used in a couple different places. We basically pass in like our plugin manager and then we tell it to return our plugin manager rather than, um, yeah, we want to return our instance of a plugin manager, not like anything else. And then there's a couple other pieces here but, and these are just kind of filled in, like as I was building the plugin manager, I was like, it, as soon as it tried to like, query Jenkins, I would just basically return a mock for different, different pieces. Like get computers, I think returns the plugins directory. And this is based on like what system that you're end up using. Uh, yeah, so, so a lot of these are just explicit methods that are used while the plugin manager is loading itself up. The other class that is mocked out here is this mock extensions list. And this is, needs a fuller exp explanation of what's going on, but this is another thing that's internal to Jenkins that is um, used to figure out oh, the types of pieces inside of, um, how, best to how best to describe this? It's like, it's a, it's a, that, this is helping you get the annotations and different parts of the extensions from Jenkins. So if we wanted a reference. Oh, sorry, go for it. No, no. So, so we, the I think of extensions as things that I add on to the settings for Git, for instance, to tell it to do something different or do this other thing or do that thing. Is this one of those kind of extensions? Is that the concept here? Is Anything I add into Jenkins, I'm commonly using a, a thing I think of as an extension. Mm -hmm. okay. So this will help you get what you get the extensions. Got it. Great. So you can see here that, and this is again like very internal. So this is another inter Jenkins internal piece. So the stuff that you were talking about, Mark, where you like annotate with the extension and then you list it out. Like what inside is you do like at extension and then it's the quotes and then what the extension is inside, right? So now you can use this basically when you query the plugin manager, it will go down a couple lists into this extension list. And you can see here this load. We want to be able to tell it to use the um, hyperlocal plugin manager's plugin strategy. And the plugin strategy is used on. Is basically used by the by a plugin manager to say how you want to be able to load plugins, and we actually have a copy of that defined here inside of our plugin manager. Again, it's also we can be able to access the plugins locally, and some of the things inside of Jenkins too, like the plugin strategies. Um, it's only defined at the Jenkins level as an abstract class and like the actual Jenkins plugin manager, this like local plugin manager, which again, I think is also an abstract class. Like the one that's actually used by Jenkins defines the plugin strategy like as a private class <laughs> inside of itself. So I couldn't just copy, like I couldn't just get to that plugin manager that was provided by Jenkins because it was private. So I had to define a plugin manager in here or plugin strategy in here. Part of the plugin manager, <laughs> You can also see there's this um, class loader. And this is the actual instance itself, that, or the actual object that has the references to all the different classes inside of Jenkins. So all those different things that after it's been imported will go into here, and then you can query this to be able to get instances of different classes. If this is getting too, into, <laughs> too deep into other pieces, you can let me know. I don't know how much how helpful some of this is to actually um, being able to see, like extract the steps. Because after like all of this is done, the ba basically the really important thing that we want to do here is we can use, after we have a references plugin manager that's been loaded up, we can um, tell it to, where is it? 
we can basically say get stuff descriptor or the, this get stuff descriptors and we can use it to be like call run tasks and it will be able to and it's this is this is another way to be able to actually like use the task manager this is kind of sorry it's getting a little complicated but um yeah like <laughs> I can understand how this is kind of going in there, but basically we can end up using like the stuff descriptors and the extent like the extensions and query the hyperlocal plugin manager to be able to get that piece, those pieces of information. So, so yeah, are I'll you look. okay if if I ask a, a sort of a directing question towards Sagar has was the one who had originally started this on this on this line of questioning. Sure. That he's looking at how could he apply this to the REST API. And I'm assuming what we were, what what the technique then would be is, whereas the pipeline steps doc generator looks for pipeline steps, the thing that the REST API would be looking for is it would be looking for things that are providing REST API endpoints. And so instead yeah. of a step descriptor class, he might be using something different. Yes. So yeah. So instead, like this is kind of the important line here. Because this this is kind of like this here is this init strategy, and this diagram plugins. Because as we saw before, like this plugin diagram plugins method here, um, ignore the Jenkins internal stuff. This this is the this is the important method. <laughs> so yeah, this this right. So this these three lines pretty much tell it to get started the init strategy. Um, I think it's defined. It, it's something that you can import from Jenkins. We basically pass it in and say, diagram the plugins is basically tell it to go. And because it's execute reactor comes again from like how Jenkins tells the plugin manager to run. I'm not 100% sure right now like why it does it this way, but this is I just know that this is how it has like a reactor is how Jenkins interacts with the plugin manager. So basically, I just copied the execute reactor method and told it to paste basically told it to run. Um, I think there might be some reason that's why it's like has some mock Jenkins stuff that you have to tell it that it's as a reactor. And then, um, yes, and then here, instead of looking for you look for REST API annotations, I don't know what they are, but I just know that the step descriptor one works for the plugin steps. So then after that, you have um, a lit, it, it will return and this find components, um, you can search for anything based on class and it will return a list of that class. And then from there, everything below that, like this is the part that I think you're going to care about. And then everything below this is basically getting it to the point where, um, excuse me, like it basically getting it to the point where it can uh, generate the ASCII doc, which was its own fun because there was no Java, at the time when I was writing this, there was like no good Java library to be able to generate ASCII doc. So that's why like this document exists or this class exists. It goes and actually takes a whole bunch of pieces that are very specific to like what a step is and then appends a whole, it, it's, it's a little painful. It takes string appending and just builds this doc, like builds this massive string of <laughs> layers for that is ASCII doc. Um, I kind of wish there was like a better way that other than string string appending. I think if you're doing REST documentation, it's a lot easier to be able to, um, I think there's libraries out there that would help you with this, but for ASCII doc, there wasn't. So it looks, this. that's why this class and this quasi descriptor are a little messy. I'd hope there would be a better way <laughs> than being able to build it like that. So, right. So, Sagar, are you okay with what you've heard so far? Any questions that you have? I'm I'm fascinated, Kristen. Thank you very much. I will I will keep asking you questions for another sure. hour if we're not careful. <laughs> okay. Sagar, yeah, sure. <laughs> did you have specific questions? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Kristen, for this um, beautiful presentation. And uh, so currently, I don't have a question to be honest. Um, but so far, what I understand, what she said is um, um, cloning all the uh, plugins and then. Um, you said there are three lines, which is um, quite important. Uh, what they are doing is ex actually extracting the classes that we um, cares about, and then from that actually from that classes which you named, I believe, step descriptor. You are just extracting mm -hmm. your Rascal tokens. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess. Excellent. Right. Okay. Continue, Kristen. Sure. I, I don't. 
know what else we really want to uh, go into here. There's a couple, let's say some of these are kind of maybe a little bit, so some of these are going to go a little bit more into um, pulling out information about the steps, like this process steps piece. This is going to be very, like this is actually, you're, when the stuff for the REST API generator, you'll probably write something similar, but very focused on how the REST calls look inside it, like how the REST pieces look. I don't know really, <laughs> I don't know too, like when I looked at this, it was very much as like, okay, what this is the step descriptor class? Like what are the different pieces? You'd have to look at the REST API ones as like kind of maybe build something similar. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I, yeah, it's like this is just kind of figuring out what's the plugin name. Um, this might be helpful for figuring out that piece because you can get a descriptor and then there's a method inside of plugin manager where it like act like the plugin manager could actually tell you this stuff and that those pieces are found inside of here as well it, it's just kind of like a bet this is kind of like the benefit of having a whole plugin manager rather than trying to figure out how to parse these files yourself because it has the plugin manager itself has a whole bunch of methods that are just useful for being able to parse the information that it holds inside of itself especially like this get plugin name for descriptor. Like these are things that the plugin manager can do. And since we created our own local version, we can take advantage of it, which is awesome. <laughs> Versus trying to have to parse everything ourselves. Like that's kind of the whole reason again, like we've used the plugin manager. It's, there's, it's powerful, it can do things for us. And it means that we don't have to go through and try to like search on, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of plugins <laughs> and it, all of them could have pieces. This allows the plugin manager to just do it for us. So that's kind of why we, I went down this path um, with the generator. Like I wanted to be able to take advantage of the plugin manager's abilities to have these things built in. Thank you very much, Kristen. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Saigar, it sounds like you've got what you need. Did you have any other questions before we go on to other topics? Uh, uh, no. Um... Yeah, no, um, I'm just going to now break down this video into what she said and taking a, uh, what actually that clo clo uh, like the code block is doing and trying to relate it with our REST API. Right. Um, yeah. So I, what would be really helpful here, and I think at one point, um, actually, now that I'm thinking about this, I think Andrew Bear tried at one point to take out the hyperlocal plugin manager and all the mocking pieces into another repository. So maybe that as part of the project that would be useful because we don't really want to repeat code, right? So like if it's possible to like take those pieces out so they can be used by more than one thing. I don't know what other documentation would need to be generated, um, but it, yeah, it could be helpful in the future. Basically yeah, like these, like basically being able to take out the plugin manager, these Jenkins, it has, uh, another thing I should point out, um, because of the way the Mockito works, it has to be in main Java Hudson folder because that's how it's stored. Like, thankfully, not too many levels deep, <laughs> but like the Java Hudson is where the package is located inside Jenkins. So it just has to follow that same folder structure. Um, if you take those pieces mm -hmm. out, it can be used by anyone and anywhere. Um, but yeah, like basically, again, like in two halves, I always take like this mocking half. And then as soon as you get to this part where after you execute the reactor, and basically load up all the plugins, feel free, <laughs> go, go for it. You can figure out, you can do anything <laughs> that the plugin manager allows you to do because now you have a reference to it and you don't have to worry about spinning up Jenkins. Mm. Cool. Mm. I have a question here. Sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, the class, the plugin manager that you're using, yeah. is this the same as plugin installation manager, the tool from Jenkins? No. So the plugin installation manager is another really cool thing, but the plugin installation manager, it helps you basically get to the point before you want to start your Jenkins. So that will go and um, it plugin installation manager will take a list or you can either take like a string separate comma separate value list, or I think you can use a YAML file. Mark, you can back me up on this, <laughs> that one. Okay, good. So a YAML file and you can actually and use that to go and download the plugins in the first half. So almost you could use these projects together, right? You can go and say, hey, here are the list of plugins that I wanna install, or I, I would like to basically run with my, to get the plugin steps, the pipeline steps for, download them to a folder. And then when you run the docs generator, you point it at that folder. And then it will just look at that subsection of plugins. The, um, 
I really, I think the project that, that was a Google Summer of Code project like two years ago. It was, it was really, it's really cool. So. Yeah, like, yeah, it was uh, uh, two years ago also. And this year, uh, Oleg has like mentioned this project, like some improvements for the tool. So I think this year also, this is in the ideas list. Project yeah, ideas. I actually helped with that project two years ago too. So if you have any questions about it, I can answer those as well. So maybe it's a good thing I joined today. But um, do you have any specific questions about that project? Yeah, actually I have. I have been like uh, thinking, uh, I read the details about the project idea and there was like improvements uh, which were based on the tickets uh, on the, which were posted on Jira or the issues that were posted in GitHub, like GitHub. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like there was one feature uh, like requested by some user uh, regarding the locking of the like locking the dependencies uh, for the instance. Mm -hmm. So I was like thinking uh, I didn't do much of a research, but I thought maybe while like if we're given a file to print out the uh, like if we're given the file to download the plugins, like will it be feasible to just uh, copy those things. I mean, uh, I'm sounding too simple in, in saying this, but uh, like if we want to keep, if we want to lock the like dependencies, if a user is providing us a file and we are already like spawning or we are already finding the dependencies, which like sub dependencies of the, of that plugin. So like, is this way, like the way of printing all those dependencies in a file, be a better like uh, an idea or a solution to the locking mechanism locking request did you get my point <laughs> I was so. I able to so, so what you what you're proposing i think is that you would like to if you have a version if you're providing a version of a plugin you would say yeah. find all of its dependencies and put them to a kind of like a pre because there is a preview function inside of this to be able to tell you what would be downloaded and installed so as part of that, you would like to say, all right, here's what I want to install. And then here's kind of what you need to, what, what it requires. Is that kind of what you're, the, the reason that it, this is a little bit harder <laughs> than originally thought is that um, when you have a whole bunch of different plugins inside of like basically that you define, each of them could require, and sometimes they do require different base versions of the plugin. And one of the other plugins that you might've tried to install will require a higher version than the locked or like a yeah a different version than the one that's locked so um you can end up with down the line dependency conflicts so you know you, you have like your locked version might be able like it, it it requires certain versions of the plugins to be installed and like you if you want it truly at that version you can't really have features that are being issued by plugin or by uh, plugins that are at a higher version level. So I think that's kind of like where the problem comes in. But doing a preview stuff where you can say these are exactly the versions of these plugins required by the one that you have locked is helpful. So I, I think the big, yeah, the big problem with that is it's just like so hard to be able to do the dependency map pre um, calculations. I think like halfway through that project, there we ended up finding some other class like other projects that would have made it easier to do version dependency calculations and i think that might be useful to look into for this for the download project is to see like what else there's some code out there to like how to write a package manager and like that might be able to be helpful for doing these calculation steps so if you can look to see no, like some that. articles oh sorry uh, no, 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 please, please go on. Like I was just saying, uh, yeah, can you, if we can mention the names of some, some of the... Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, fi I'll find them and put them in the channel. But like th those might be something good to look at as kind of like a, an overview of how to do the dependency calculation stuff. Because yeah, it, it, it got really hard <laughs> at a certain point. I mean, it's really fun. It's a really fun problem, right? Like, and it's something that you know, you'd love to do. You have these huge maps and you have to figure out what's the most optimal thing to download. <laughs> you can't have duplicates. You only have one <laughs> because Jenkins will not be happy if you try to install multiple of the same plugin. Um, so like, which one do we end up installing? And so I'll see if I can find those again and post them in the GitHub, but like that, or sorry, in the Gitter channel. Um, but th that would help with how to help do the dependency calculations. 
I have a contextual mm -hmm. question. This discussion sure. has has turned to being um, about the proposal for the plug-in installation management yeah. to improvement. Okay, um, <laughs> which is to update. Yes, update the plug-in installation. Yeah, so, sorry for that. Sorry for that. No, no, sorry. no, no. Please, this should be a free-ranging discussion. I, I love it when people just take ideas and run with them and connect them to new things. So that's perfect. It's, it was really for me. Um, okay. And then that question of dependency management and managing mm -hmm. different versions of dependencies that may be needed. Um, doesn't, are we, so the idea is that we would essentially roll our own for that. Does it not seem that there should be some, some open source tool that should be able to help us with dependency? Right. Like it does seem like a very package manager type problem, which seems like there's been so much work done in that space already. I just don't know what tools could be used with Jenkins, but. Mm -hmm. that, that's what was hard, like, right? Cause yeah. we were just basically like, all we want from the package management tool is just that calculation step because we've already got all the files. And like, we already do our management, but um, inside of Jenkins, it's just kind of like, take the latest. <laughs> and so um, it was just like, okay, how can we basically get that, the, ca the calculation? And it's like, if we can just take the calculation, that's what we would want to take from the tool. Because right, you're right, Kara, like there's a ton of tools out there to be able to do this already for almost every flavor. But it's like, we just, I think that that uh, installation manager tool just is supposed to act like our dependency manager, or it, it's just supposed to be like our package management tool. Yeah. We just need a better, I, we just wanted to kind of look at um, how best to calculate the version required. So. Yeah, that's a really interesting problem. Um, yeah, actually, it, it's it's really cool. I, it's I love a, <laughs> kind of both. It's of very complex, are, also. <laughs> yeah, it's just like that's what it's like. Both of these projects are really interesting. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's like the the one kind of how to come up with the data structure to be able to store everything and the sorting was really fascinating. So. I am surrounded by graph theory near nerds. It is yes. really right. <laughs> it's awesome. I, I am not a big I'm not a big lover of graph theory, so I'm glad to have other people who love graph theory. That's really great. That's really wonderful. Great. I think that's everything for me. Does anyone else have anything about this? Would they would like to have questions or just just to um uh, ask more from you, Kristen, actually. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> you, are more than, you are more than welcome. You, we would be very grateful and excited for you if you had any time to um, volunteer to mentor for GSOC. And if, if you had that space in your schedule, if you wanted to put yourself down as a mentor for either of those projects, that would be great. Okay. I, I should just say, and I don't know if this is being, if we're messaging this clearly enough, but um, and I, I should be working harder on this. The GSEC projects this year are half the size, essentially, in terms of hours mm. being demanded of the students. Okay. So the overall projects will themselves be smaller as well. They'll have a smaller scope. Um, and this also means, obviously, it's not going to be half the work for mentors, but it, it, it is a, a little bit of a reduction in what's going to be demanded of mentors because the projects will be smaller. But uh, the more mentors, the better. Then we, we all share the, the load, too, so it's good. Sure. Actually, I got a question about that. So when does it start this year? The, you know, it's like this multi-phase um, process. The oh, okay. coding <laughs> phase is not until the summer. It's, it's basically okay. the same 10 weeks. Um, and actually, I can answer oh, okay. that so it's, precisely. So it still, so still starts June 7th. Okay, yeah. So it's still starts. over the same number of weeks. It's just reduced hours within the weeks. Right. Yeah, okay. It's from, okay. June seventh, August sixteenth, and then the reduced hours are really just taking into account the fact that this is this is quite a year, and I think they're trying to think new with GSOC. So basically, students and mentors can work out how they want to arrange their hours of work, depending like if students have exams or they have something going on in their personal lives, and that's fine. We should be flexible with them, and similarly for mentors as well, um, which is why it's nice to have multiple multiple mentors. But yes, for um, submitting our application as a GSOC project, that application is due very soon. That's due on February 19th. So it's nice to okay. have additional mentor names down sure. so we you know, have that as part of our application. 
And then uh, in March, the organizations that are chosen are announced. And then there's the student application period and then the student bonding period. But coding mm -hmm. proper doesn't start until June. All right, awesome. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for that, Kara. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Yeah, I'm no, glad to help. And talking with us. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, I will stop sharing. There we go. And again, if there's any other questions, just let me know. I'll try to, I'll be better about being in the channel. <laughs> Sorry. Hey. Okay. Deeply appreciated, Kristen. Thank you, thank you. So Bob is also with us. Um, Himanshu or Sagar, did either of you have questions relative to any of the cloud native topics, the cloud events plugin or anything like that? If not, that's okay. But Vibhav is with us and is probably willing to answer questions if you have them on those project ideas. If you don't, no problem, no no guilt there. It's just we we've got one more potential mentor here as well. If if there, you have questions on cloud events or on oh dear, it was the Kuber, the other Kubernetes project. Help me out, um, Caro. What was the other one? Uh, the Tech on Client plugin. And actually, oh, I have right. questions. I have questions for Vibhav. <laughs> As Great. as well, um, but I'll I'll let the prospective students go first, <laughs> or or I will. Um, but Bob, I had a question on your design doc for GSOC Cloud Events plugin proposal. Um, I gave a little bit of feedback, but in general, I think I think it looks great. Um, have Have you been able to uh, connect that design doc to the the proposal that's on? Um, on the Jenkins GSOC page. Um, I I haven't updated it there, but uh, let let me open a pull request to start that then. Uh, okay. That... I, I still need to go over all the stuff. Okay. Go over tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, that would be awesome because I think it, it's helpful for um, students considering the project. And then I wanted to ask. I didn't see but you know it, it might be me i didn't see the um tecton client plugin are you still happy to propose that as a gsoc project idea yes uh so for the tecton client plugin i i uh, what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna create a uh design doc which which kind of uh, explains what the client plugin does so anyone who is, who wants to get started can easily get started of what, uh, what already exists and then uh, I, uh, I'll create the proposal and uh, create a PR for the proposal uh, within tomorrow probably. So I'll, I'll do that. Awesome. So there are few. That's great. Did you have any um questions for us as organizers any anything that would be helpful on our end just so i know that i'm not i just want to make sure you feel supported as someone who's proposing ideas <laughs> okay <laughs> um, I, I i i need to gather questions uh i so this is the first meeting i'm attending and uh, i was actually in a sprint review just some five minutes ago. So I need to, so I will, I will ask questions. Maybe in the next meeting, I might ask some questions, but for now I'm, I'm here just to attend. Okay, great. great. And do we have any student questions for the above? Uh, not from my side. Yeah. yeah I'm also going for the moment, maybe next week. Okay. Sounds good. And then I have questions um, essentially for Mark <laughs> as, as uh, my mentor in this <laughs> process. Um, we have had potential GSOC uh, proposal ideas that have been submitted on the Jenkins CI dev channel uh, mailing list. So they, they are public and you know, it's, it's hard for me to understand how, how, where to go with them. So they, they've been proposed as, as rough sketches. They have some merit as projects. There's been a little bit of feedback, but it hasn't really gone beyond that stage. So what do you suggest I do, Mark? And specifically, I'm, I'm talking about if you've seen the Jenkins operator 
and virtuous labs may be able to commit some mentors as well so that's kind of cool and it's a fun project and the other one is the maintainer's heartbeat that gavin's proposed so um i don't no, I mean, I can share my screen. We can look at the email, but that's maybe a bit excessive. Um, so, <laughs> so I let you decide, Mark. What, what do you think? Should I follow up with you later? Do you want to discuss it now? I think, I think a good, a good, one of, the, one of the common patterns I've seen anyway is people submit a proposal and receive no feedback. And one way to bring it to life then is to ask a question relative to it or two of us ask questions so we get some clarification that helps the, the person making the proposal realize, ah, oh, there is interest. And it helps them also get their ideas more precisely formed so that they could take the form of a project idea submission to the, to the Jenkins.io website. So, because I, I think ultimately when you submit the pack or when CDF submits the package to Google Summer of Code on uh, what, before the 19th, we submit that has to include a list of project ideas that are are in fact project ideas with mentors behind them and and so so we need we need more detail from them and we need them eventually on the website so they've only got right now eight days basically to to get from google doc to pull requests to the jenkins.io site merged ready to go into the into the submission to google Okay. Yeah. So I think um, just ask them a question. I can certainly act as voice to ask questions as well, if that'll help. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. I'll follow up. I'll follow up on both those, especially the Virtus Lab ones. They, they were at the Cloud Native SIG last week and I'm discussing the Jenkins operator and, and, and then followed up saying they could make it into a GSOC potential. Well, and, and so that would be you've nice. got Cloud Native SIG meets again tomorrow, if I recall correctly, doesn't it? Or is it uh, a week Friday. from tomorrow? Mm -hmm. uh, Friday. So, all oh, right, it, it meets Friday. So, if that's another good place to to have discussions and help them yeah. get closer and closer to an actual project idea that is that meets all the criteria we have for a project idea, that it has a quick start, that it has mentors, that it has enough skeleton on the you know, enough, enough general outline that a student could actually take it and, and have, have it as a good idea for their beginning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good, 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 good. Hopefully. Yeah. We'll move that forward rapidly in the next couple of days. Great. Um, and then to circle back, um, to the hyper local plugin manager that Kristen discussed, is it worth me contacting Andrew Bayer and asking him if he did it sort of factor that out into its own little project to be used. So, so I think it got factored out and it's mm -hmm. like not updated. <laughs> that might've been, th this has been, this has existed for, like, this project has been around for like four or five years. And I think he did it like maybe like four years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it might be worth um, making sure that they're, they, I, and I know that updates have been made to this class, especially um, I think Mark, you were even involved with updating the Jenkins version that this depended on. So like making sure that those changes are into that particular class uh, or into that project would be helpful. It, it just kind of went off on it. I think he realized he wanted to use it for something and then just kind of, you know, it's one of those things where you, you start it and then you just kind of, it kind of withered or it didn't, didn't, it's not like kept up with maintenance. So it's just hard to make sure that it also is being at the most recent, like the most recent version of Jenkins. Um, and there's a couple other pieces that I think Zebnik, who's been really awesome, has also been looking, especially with making sure the display looks really good, <laughs> because there were some display issues, I think, early on with generating that big string. Um, I think he might have made some improvements too, so in certain, on certain lines, especially with the upgrade. So it's just, that project, I think, is kind of just sitting. I don't think it's been updated at all. So, but I think for this particular project, it might be useful to maybe revive that <laughs> and then update that piece just because it's something that can also be used for um, the REST API, basically update that and then uh, <laughs> maybe be able to use it in both projects. I, I don't know if that now makes this way too long for, <laughs> for a Google Summer of Code project proposal, but I would think that that, to me, like that would be really beneficial to being able to get both of those pieces using the same underlying 
um, plugin manager code and also to make sure that it or just anyone else can use it if they find it find it useful for them. Sorry, oh, go for it, Mark. <laughs> so, so Kristen is is such an, a software engineer. I love software engineers when they tell us about avoiding duplication, etc. I'm yeah. much more lazy. I'd have just copied the code, Sagar. So <laughs> I don't feel the least bit shame in copying oh, code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so Kristen is being very software engineer, and that's really <laughs> great. That is so impressive. And I'm, I'm much more. I've got a problem I need to solve. I want to. I'll just dirty copy the code. And if someday in the future I want to refactor it to read to, to be dry, you know, to not repeat myself. Oh, that would be great. But so. Good, That's good, a good for point. Kristen. She's teaching you good <laughs> principles, and I'm I'm expressing my my dirty, nasty behavior. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's like definitely get started, just copy it all. <laughs> okay, sorry, <laughs> Bob. <laughs> but, um, by the way, Mark, I had a question for you. If uh, this is not uh, going in another direction. Uh, so I want to ask, how are the how would the goal setting be done for this year's uh, GSOC exactly? Like I haven't uh, been in a GSOC or been a mentor before, so uh, I remember you saying on uh, on the Gitter that uh, you uh, before you guys did two meetings a week to see uh, where the student has reached in terms of uh, coding for checks and stuff, and that is how you actually get stuff done. So I just wanted to ask how this will change for a one and a half month long period of coding, uh, which is actually quite less, in my opinion. I, and and I, I think that, I assume that the project team, that the mentors and the student will decide how they want to do that. I can tell you what worked for us, and I know if, if I'm chosen to mentor, if if somebody will finally pick up one of the Git projects and choose that so that I can mentor, if, if the, one of the Git projects gets selected and we get a student who does it, we will negotiate with the student that I would personally bias towards twice a week still, even with the student only working roughly half time. Because the frequent check-in was so valuable for the student, it left much less time for them to be wandering in the wrong direction before the mentors could point them in the correct direction. So we might, we might go 30 minutes twice a week, but the twice a week was so valuable. We, we initially started only once a week and once a week just left too long a time for the student to sort of wander or not feel connected to the project and twice a week was much more useful. But, but you'll, you'll set that as a, as a team and, Thankfully, you'll mm. learn by sort of hard experience what works for you as and for the student. Okay, that that sounds, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, because the student needs to be uh, connected, and once a week is actually very less uh, of a time for any team to uh, like get together and work together. Once a week is very sh short amount of time. Also. Um, Another question I had was, uh, I could so if if the time period was three months, uh, the cloud so we could have started with the cloud events plugin from scratch almost. So uh, the thing is with the Tecton client plugin, it's already in POC and we can kind of build tasks around what needs to get done, and then those tasks will be what what would happen on over the period of the coding phase, but. Uh, with something like a cloud plugin, a cloud events plugin, I'm just uh, I'm just not sure uh, how to do the goal setting exactly. Uh, it probably might be easier even for cloud events plugin because there's one goal. Uh, it should be kind of like the webhook trigger plugin, where uh, upon listening to the cloud event, it will trigger a job or something like that. But uh, for for this for so how do you do goal setting in uh, in something that is a lit, involves a bit of like innovation, I, I guess. Uh, like, but, so uh, yeah, that's basically my question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the we were doing something like that with the Git plugin. Uh, last year's project had a a proposal to do something a certain way, and as we went through the project, we discovered, oh, 
there were things we didn't know when we did, defined the project that would now we know during its implementation. We each adjusted the, the goals at that time. We described, hey, we think we need to change your direction and do this other thing. So I think the first objective is that the student in their project plan proposes a goal. And that goal that they propose should be something they feel strongly about. This should be my goal as a student in this project. And your, your phrase sounds like a good one for the cloud events plugin. It should process cloud events when they arrive. Uh, it should be able to publish cloud events. And those, those feel like really good goals. And that's sort of a vision statement that the student can include in their project plan. Was, was that what you were asking me, Bob, or did I misunderstand? Yeah, that makes uh, that that is uh, that makes sense. Uh, that does make sense. Yeah, because in this way, the student can themselves uh, figure out how to go about uh, their career on this. Sorry, their path on this GSOC uh, project. So how? So uh, that actually bring, brings up something interesting: is uh, how much of the uh, project is actually student led? Uh, obviously, like there are mentors, but how much of the project, like the plan for the project, is decided by the student itself? It, uh, it should be. It should be the student's project plan. So what the what the what the Jenkins project will accept is a stu ultimately is a student project plan, a project plan submitted by the student. So right now we're in this project ideas phase where ideas are proposed by anyone, but when when it comes time to select the, the few people who will actually be authorized to go forward, will have mentors assigned and will be staffed projects, then we're actually, we are choosing the student's proposed project plan. And actually the same project idea could result in multiple plans from different students. And we're choosing one of those plans and the student that submitted that plan. Does, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. That yeah, actually, yeah, that that actually tells me that I need to do more reading uh, on, on GSOC guidelines and stuff. Uh, yeah, so yeah, but thank you, Mark. Thanks, thanks for the detailed explanation. Super. Yeah, and, and looking forward to this. We're going to have fun. Cara, back to you. Yep. <laughs> We're definitely going to have fun. Um, the only thing I would add to that is that um, we very much want the students to contribute to open source. We want them to, to produce something that they can show. And that is, that is the goal. But um, an even broader or more fundamental goal is, is actually the students learning and experience with open source. So it's actually okay for the student to have parts of their GSOC experience be like, oh, I tried this and it didn't work. And I can explain, you know, why it didn't work and what, what I learned from it. And then we went and tried this and that's okay. You know, like it doesn't need to be, um, not every step of this as a work project needs to go perfectly for the student. They are allowed to actually explore and try different things. So having that space within their project idea of like, where they're going to figure out their way forward is actually, it's, it's fine, it's okay. Um, it gives them more space for them to bring their own creativity and their own trial and error and the experience of that. So it's not just about, you know, writing production code, <laughs> although we, we do want their code to go into production. So does that, does that, does that seem right, Mark? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yes, having fun is, is the most important part and really enjoying open source. And contributing to Jenkins. So. <laughs> Great. Okay. So it's basically top of the hour. Do we have any extra questions for today for our mentors who are with us? Or do the mentors have any questions? Okay. Great. Thank you all for being here today with us. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.